This is how to build a nuke. Disclaimer, please don't actually build a nuclear weapon. This is for educational and awareness purposes only. Nukes 101, the most powerful man-made explosions in history, the destroyer of worlds. All right, so back up a bit. How on earth does a nuke even work? It all started in 1938 when a German scientist discovered how to split the nucleus of an atom. When he did this, he realized an enormous amount of energy was released in the process. This is the first step of nuclear energy called nuclear fission. Now, to be clear, an enormous amount of energy is relative to the size of an atom's nucleus, which is insane tiny. Splitting one uranium atom releases around 0.00003 joules of energy. So you would need to split over 30,000 uranium atoms just to get one joule, which is about the force of an apple falling one meter to the ground. So you need to split over 30,000 uranium atoms just to get glonked on the head with an apple. But a new form of energy was still huge news, especially coming from Germany in 1938. And I think we all know what happened after that. The US heard of this news and got so shook that they developed an entire program to create a new type of weapon using this nuclear fission process. And thus, the infamous Manhattan Project was born. By 1945, the first nuclear explosion ever, called the Trinity Test, was set off with one kiloton of power or a thousand tons of TNT, and this is how that bomb works. It's a traditional atomic bomb using only nuclear fission. The nucleus of an atom is held incredibly tightly together with protons and neutrons, which takes energy to keep them bound together. If we fire a stray neutron into the nucleus, it causes the atom to be split, forming two smaller nuclei and releasing energy, but also releasing more stray neutrons in the process, which in turn hit other nuclei that split, causing a chain reaction. Nuclear fission in a nutshell. This all happens incredibly fast, splitting over 10 to the 24 atoms in a microsecond, which set off the one kiloton explosion of the Trinity test. The reason we use uranium-235 atoms in these nukes is because they're radioactive. They have unstable nuclei, meaning they have too many protons or neutrons, and they're constantly ejecting them in an attempt to become stable. This ejecting of particles is called radioactive decay and produces energy in the form of radiation, which are invisible rays that damage our skin and internal organs, even affecting our immune system and DNA itself, which can cause sickness and mutations in humans. So radiation ain't it for us. Anyway, atoms with unstable nuclei like uranium-235 are easier to split due to this instability, and that's why we use them. With all this knowledge, the US then dropped Little Boy, which was 15 kilotons, on Hiroshima to try to end World War II. This bomb had two pieces of U-235 inside of it like this. Conventional explosives were set off to fire the first piece into the second piece, which were then smashed together together, compressing the atoms to start the fission reaction. For maximum destruction, it needs to be detonated about 600 meters above the surface, so it's not like it just hit the ground and blew up on impact. On detonation, it instantly vaporized everything within a 180 meter radius, scorched the ground up to 4,000 degrees Celsius within 2 kilometers, and sent shockwaves that destroyed everything within 3 kilometers. Literal hell on earth. Japan didn't surrender, so 3 days later, Team America dropped Fat Man, which was 21 kilotons, on Nagasaki. This one was built a little different. Instead of uranium, they used plutonium. 239, which has a faster fission rate and wouldn't have worked in the gun barrel design of Little Boy. So with Fat Man, they had a plutonium sphere in the center with a layer of uranium around it. Conventional explosives were placed all around this sphere of destruction that would compress it on detonation to activate the fission reaction and cause an even bigger boom, absolutely annihilating the Japanese city, even causing radioactive rainfall and finally forcing Emperor Hirohito into surrender. Use this site to find out how much damage a nuke would do in your city. Over hundreds of thousands of fatalities resulted from these blasts, with millions affected for the general after. Sure didn't stop the Soviets because in 1949 they became the second country ever to detonate a nuke officially starting the Cold War. In 1952, the US develops the hydrogen bomb, which was around a thousand times more powerful than their previous atom bombs. Hydrogen bombs are a thousand times more powerful than regular atomic nukes, and this is how to build one. Disclaimer, please don't actually build a nuke, these are for educational purposes only. H-bombs use a new type of nuclear energy called fusion, much more powerful than the fission we learned back in 101. Basically, instead of just splitting atoms, we're now also fusing them together, which works better best with really simple atoms, and is why we use hydrogen, the most basic element there is having only one proton. Just like a magnet, the positive charges of two hydrogen atoms repel one another. But if we overcome that force of repulsion and squeeze them together really hard, we create a helium atom, which has two protons and release energy in the process, similar to how we did with fission. So inside these hydrogen bombs, we have hydrogen compressed into as small as space as possible. In order to kickstart the fusion process, we gotta blast them with an unreasonable amount of heat. We're talking a hundred million degrees Celsius, which is seven times hotter than the core of our 
sun. And this fusion process is also how our sun itself generates heat. So how do we generate this amount of heat in a hydrogen bomb to kickstart fusion? With a nuclear fission reaction, of course. Be sure to watch Nukes 101 to learn how that works. This is what's called a thermonuclear weapon, in which a fission reaction is used to activate the fusion reaction for the ultimate destruction. With the first H-bomb ever tested, codenamed Ivy Mike, dropped on remote islands in the Pacific with a force of 10.4 megatons. That's 10,400,000 tons of TNT. The fireball itself was over 6.4 kilometers wide and is said to have shown brighter than a thousand suns. The US won up themselves in 1954 with Castle Bravo reaching 15 megatons dropped on an area in the Pacific called Bikini Atoll. Which, side note, is where Bikini Bottom from Spongebob got its name? Bottom of the ocean in the Bikini Atoll region where the sea creatures got so irradiated from nuclear testing that they started to form consciousness and bam, Spongebob was born. And it's also why everything in Spongebob always explodes for no reason. They literally even use this test footage in one episode. Anyway, the Soviets saw this and all they had to say was hold my beer or vodka, I guess, because they were about to outdo everyone in the biggest way possible. Okay, let's summarize the scale of the bombs we've been making so far. Little Boy on Hiroshima was a mere 15 kilotons. Then the Ivy Mike test was 10,400 kilotons or 10.4 megatons, with Castle Bravo topping that at 15 megatons, the biggest nuke drop by the US in history. In 1961, the Soviets tested a hydrogen bomb that was 57 megatons, almost 4,000 times more powerful than Little Boy, called the Tsar Bomba, and is still to this day the most powerful nuclear device that has ever been tested. This thing was so insanely huge that the pilots tasked with dropping it were only given a 50-50 chance of survival. It was dropped on a remote island far north in the Arctic Ocean. And they even attached a parachute to it to slow its descent so the pilots can top gun it the hell out of there as soon as they released it. They dropped it, dipped as fast as they could, and when the bomb detonated, the shockwave was so powerful that it knocked the plane out of the sky over 100 kilometers away. The plane plummeted for a full kilometer towards the ground, but luckily the pilots regained control and survived. 50-50 chance gone right. All in on red, baby. And when they looked behind them, they saw the biggest explosion in human history, annihilating everything within a 35 kilometer radius and a mushroom cloud over 60 kilometers high. This test was nothing but a measuring contest. No, in reality, it would have been much more efficient and cost effective to just drop several smaller nukes than one of this size. By the 1960s, the UK, France, and China all began testing their own nukes. And is why in 1996, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty was signed, banning all nuclear testing on the entire planet. But it sure didn't stop India, Pakistan, and North Korea from blowing shit up with their most recent nuclear test by our boy Kim Jong-un in 2017. Hey, somebody keep an eye on that guy. And that is how nukes are made, and also why you definitely shouldn't build one either. A single gram of uranium contains 20 billion calories and is one of the deadliest substances known to man. <sighs> I really didn't want to do this, but everyone just could not stop asking me about it. This is Nukes 103, how to build a nuke, your step-by-step -step tutorial. And if you're still asking how by the end of this, then this nuke stuff probably isn't for you. As always, disclaimer, please don't actually build a nuke, this is for educational purposes purposes only. Today, we're talking modern nuclear weapons, which are pretty much all hydrogen bombs. We went over atom bombs versus hydrogen in my previous Nukes 101 and 102 videos, so you can check those out for more info. And heads up, just by getting this far into the video, you're already on dozens of government watch lists, so let's get started. Nukes are built off of Einstein's famous E equals MC squared equation, which basically just means you can get a lot of energy from a tiny bit of mass. To put it in perspective, explosions like these only convert about a kilogram of mass into pure energy, so we can see how powerful this equation is. A modern hydrogen bomb is actually three bombs in one. Standard chemical explosives, a fission bomb like the atom bombs dropped on Japan, and a fusion bomb. The most important ingredient here is uranium, which is needed to make the more radioactive plutonium. The reason we use uranium is because its atoms are radioactive, meaning it has an unstable nucleus and is constantly shooting out protons and neutrons to try to become stable. This is called radioactive decay, and here's an actual video of what that looks like using special equipment. Uranium emitting deadly radiation in a cloud chamber, and those particles shooting out go right through your skin and can cause sickness and cancer. And just like unstable relationships, unstable atoms are easier to split apart, so we use them for nuclear fission. Watch my 101 video to learn how that works. Now, dumbing it down as much as I can, we mine uranium from the Earth, process it, and then blast it with neutrons in a special way to turn it into U-239, which undergoes something called beta decay to become neptunium. Yup, that's a real thing. I just found that out too. And then again, another beta decay to finally turn into plutonium. This is all done in a lab, making plutonium a completely man-made element. Now let's put it all together to make our warhead. From the top, we got beryllium casing that holds all of our bombs together. Inside, we have our regular chemical explosives, like trinitrogen nitrotoluene or TNT in a sphere with more beryllium casing inside. Within that inner casing, there's our fission bomb, a sphere of plutonium about 46 inches in diameter. Below all that is our fusion bomb, which consists of an external uranium cylinder filled with lithium deuteride. This white powdery substance gives us 
is the hydrogen we need for a hydrogen bomb. More specifically, this powder generates deuterium and tritium when exposed to heat, which are two isotopes of hydrogen that produce even more energy when fused than hydrogen on its own and is why we use it. Inside the lithium deuteride powder, we got a plutonium rod and all of these are insulated with styrofoam. These three explosive reactions work like dominoes. The chemical bomb initiates the splitting of atoms for a fission bomb reaction in the plutonium sphere, which generates the amount of heat needed for a fusion bomb reaction, compressing the uranium cylinder, causing our deuterium and tritium atoms, which are hydrogen isotopes, to fuse together, creating helium and releasing energy. This plutonium rod undergoes more fission, causing it to put more pressure on the lithium deuteride from the inside and creating a positive feedback loop. Fission, fusion, fission, fusion. Yeah, I know this is hard to wrap our heads around. This is nuclear physics after all. No one said it was going to be easy. This is roughly how it all looks, and the entire reaction all happens in under 600 nanoseconds. So slap that warhead onto a ballistic missile and you're in business. Well, not you, obviously, because you're not making one of these. This is illegal. Remember, this was for educational purposes only. You know, science. And in case you're wondering, yes, a single gram of uranium technically does contain 20 billion calories in terms of how much potential energy it contains. Not how much energy a person can get from it, as we see as calories on our nutrition facts. So no, you wouldn't gain 5,000 pounds from eating a gram of uranium. You'd just get cancer.